What's going on guys? Derek here with Fantasy Football Advice coming at you with another fantasy football video. Today, you know what time it is. We are going over the tight end starts and sits as we head into week three. As per usual, we will go through the top 18 tight ends, break them down, let you know overall how we feel about each matchup so you have a better understanding of which one you should start over the other. The tight end position itself is as deep as ever, so making the correct start and sit decisions is going to be vitally important to win your matchup. Before we do get into the video, Video, though stat of the day yesterday's stat of the day was which team allows the fewest fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks the correct answer was the Indianapolis Colts. Congratulations to Ugly Dude. You got this one right. As for today's stat of the day, since this is a tight end video, we're going to stick with tight ends. And today's question is which team has allowed the most receptions to the tight end position? This will not include the Thursday game, so make sure you're only going off of the first two weeks. Leave your answer in the comment section down below. We'll be happy to let you know who wins in tomorrow's video. Also, guys, when we're breaking down these tight ends, this is not going to be a rankings video. So if you have two players that are valued very similarly, you should definitely go off of our rankings. You can find those at our website. Members of our website not only get access to the rankings, you'll get our waiver, fab suggestions, access to the trade model, top DFS plays, and more. So if that interests you, go to our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com, sign up and become a member today. With that out of the way though, let's hop right into the video. And of these first six tight ends, you do have the usual names that you see here. Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, Darren Waller, Zach Ertz. Typically, George Kittle would also be in this range, but he has already been ruled out, leaving Jordan Reed as the starter. We'll talk a bit about Jordan Reed in the later part of this video. So we'll just go in order and we'll start with Travis Kelsey, who has a matchup this week against the Baltimore Ravens. They're going to be playing the Monday night game. The Baltimore Ravens faced Cleveland in week one, allowed six receptions for 70 yards and a touchdown. And Cleveland hasn't really been a team that has been getting their tight ends involved. In week two versus Houston, they allowed another nine receptions 78 yards and a second touchdown so that's a touchdown in each contest six plus receptions to no name tight ends this bodes very well for travis kelsey who may even head into this contest needing to be relied on that much more if sammy watkins is ruled out we will go over to the next tight end in this same game on the other side of the ball that's mark andrews of the baltimore ravens after coming off a massive week one explosion for six receptions 87 yards and two receiving touchdowns mark andrews followed that up with a disappointing performance posting just one reception for 29 yards his snap percentage in week one was over 70 percent we saw that take a bit of a dip to under 60 percent in week two i do want to remind you though that throughout the entire 2019 season his snap percentage was just over 40 percent and on that season he was able to put up te3 numbers obviously we would like to see that number as high as we possibly could but there's no denying it is not detrimental to his fantasy production heading into this matchup though against Kansas City you should feel very confident that his involvement will go up in a game against Kansas City who has an offense that can be almost any defense the Baltimore Ravens will need every weapon available and Mark Andrews undoubtedly is one of their best deep receiving targets as well as red zone threats up next, we have Darren Waller of the Las Vegas Raiders coming off of a monster performance against New Orleans. 12 receptions, over 100 yards. He even scored, which for Waller has not been all that common. So this was definitely one of his best games of his career. The matchup, on the other hand, it's going to be his biggest test yet. After playing New Orleans and Carolina, who is one of the worst passing defenses in the league, he now faces New England, who although has not been forced to face competition as high as Darren Waller, it is worth noting that the New England Patriots were able to hold Mike Gesicki to just three receptions for 30 yards. After seeing what Gesicki was able to do on Thursday as well as last week, we do have to give the Patriots some credit and we all know how savvy of a defense they are. They could put extra emphasis on just stopping Darren Waller, forcing them to beat them in the other aspects of the game. And if that happens, Darren Waller may have a more difficult time. Before we touch on the other options at TE that don't typically make it in the top six, Let's take a moment to talk about Zach Ertz. I'm sure a lot of you who own him are not exactly sure what to expect from Zach Ertz at this point. Through two weeks, he has a combined 60 receiving yards on just eight receptions. Thankfully, he has scored once, but even with that, he's still just inside the top 20 at the tight end position. This matchup out of all is going to be very telling on what we should expect and what we should do with Zach Ertz for the remainder of the season. I think there are two realistic outcomes, the first being that the Philadelphia 
Philadelphia Eagles offense is much worse than we thought and even with there being a lack of receiving weapons outside of him that top five tight end upside that we typically expected from him in the past few seasons may not be there this would make it more of a 1a 1b situation with Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz who would always be in top 12 tight end discussions but there would be some weeks in which you would be forced into tough decisions on if you should start Ertz or maybe a top tier option off the waiver wire the second possible outcome which I think is the most likely is that the Philadelphia Eagles have gotten off to a very terrible start their offense should continue to improve though and this week being a very meaningful one could be a get right game for them if that is the case the Philadelphia Eagles would be able to move the ball offensively get in scoring range which would overall increase the floor and ceiling of Zach Ertz maybe not to the consistent top four tight end that we have become accustomed to but definitely a mid TE1 with the upside to push top five in a good matchup and difficult matchups would still leave him starting over what was available on the waivers as for this game though like I said I am expecting the Philadelphia Eagles to have a get right game so Zach Ertz he's in the top Top six let's move over to Tyler Higby who is coming off of a week two performance he scored three receiving touchdowns he has also played in over 84 percent of snaps in each of the first two weeks compare that to Gerald Everett somebody who could potentially limit the upside of Higby who has only seen 33 and 43 percent of snaps through those two weeks so for the Rams they know Higby is clearly the guy he now finds himself in a matchup against Buffalo on paper seeing Buffalo is not a good sign for your offensive weapons this is, however, very similar to the matchup I mentioned with Travis Kelsey. The defense, it's very strong at limiting receivers and running backs, but against tight ends, Buffalo is not very scary. They currently rank near the bottom of the league when it comes to allowing receiving yards to tight ends. The same also holds true for receptions. If you think back to week two, Buffalo faced Miami, Mike Kosicki had himself a hell of a game. If the LA Rams are having trouble moving the ball downfield with Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, two receivers, receivers who haven't been getting the amount of volume we would have expected those players they're in a tough matchup Jared Goff may need to rely on Tyler Higby that much more which makes his ceiling in this matchup very very high his floor it's also solid so a top six ranking that's what we should expect this week moving on though we have Hunter Henry of the LA Chargers as we know Justin Herbert is set to start in Herbert's first start he did target Hunter Henry eight times any tight end getting eight targets is going to be one that's probably ranking inside the top 12 this week they face Carolina Carolina as we know one of the worst passing defenses in the league my only concern with this matchup would be that Carolina being so beatable by the wide receiver position it may ultimately limit how many targets we see going Hunter Henry's direction rookie quarterbacks though historically have heavily targeted the tight end position so if we do see him with a high target market share it should surprise nobody just keep in mind though that in week one Darren Waller did face Carolina he was held to just six receptions for 45 yards this game also has the third lowest projected total of the entire week which means the expectation of a lot of touchdowns for each team it's not all that likely and with the Chargers being six and a half point favorites the late stage of this game does have the potential to be more run heavy Joshua Kelly Austin Eckler very good running backs and with Herbert being a rookie quarterback Tyrod with a punctured lung they may not want to ask Herbert to do too much we're on to the next six and we are going to start with Hayden Hurst of the Atlanta Falcons Hurst is coming off of his best performance he caught a touchdown was targeted eight times but that was against the Dallas Cowboys it was also a game in which both teams scored nearly 40 points definitely not some Something we're expecting in this matchup but Julio Jones he is injured up until this point we are still not even sure if he will play if he doesn't the involvement and in ceiling of hers increases along with that and we saw in a matchup where Chicago faced the Giants they were very limiting to the wide receiver position neither Shepard Tate or Slayton was able to consistently get open it did seem as though that the tight end position was the best way that they were able to attack offensively and if that trend does hold true Matt Ryan with a depleted wide receiver core could provide Hayden Hurst with yet another good game moving over to Jared Cook of the New Orleans Saints he is in a good position this week because Michael Thomas has already been ruled out 
Traquan Smith did appear to be the favorite target in last week's matchup between him and Sanders, but even from the beginning of the game, Drew Brees was looking for Jared Cook. Had Jared Cook not struggled with drops, a potential factor that could have limited him to five targets throughout the entire game, Jared Cook's day could have looked night and day different than it did. This is in no way going to be a easy matchup for Jared Cook or the New Orleans Saints, but with Aaron Rodgers playing very well lately, this game also having a very high projected total at 53, Jared Cook should not only see more volume, but comes with a good chance to score as well. The next tight end we have is Jonu Smith of the Tennessee Titans. He currently ranks as the top tight end in all of fantasy. He is now facing the Minnesota Vikings, who have not allowed a receiving touchdown to the tight end position yet this season. Jonu Smith himself already has three receiving touchdowns, so so that could be a trend that ends this week for Minnesota. The Vikings also haven't faced any true receiving threats at the tight end position. Week 1 they faced Green Bay who doesn't really utilize that position. And in week 2 they did allow over 100 yards. When it comes to Jonu Smith we know he's talented but likely exceeding what production we can expect from him. So a good performance against a pretty solid defense against that position. That would be very telling to what we could expect for the remainder of the year. AJ Brown has already been ruled out so that's also going to increase the potential volume he's going to receive and so far the way that he's performed it's almost warranting of an auto start the next player we have is TJ Hawkinson of the Detroit Lions. He's coming into a game against Arizona. Arizona, as we know, is a very potent offense. This game has the second highest projected total coming in at 56 points. The Detroit Lions are also underdogs in this matchup, which bodes well for the potential passing game script late in this game. Hawkinson has unfortunately only had a week high of five targets. We're hoping that involvement increases. Kenny Galladay, as we know, is potentially coming back this week, but word is even if he does his snaps will be limited if this game does ultimately get out of hand i could even see galladay's involvement decreasing as the game goes on which would only benefit hawkinson who in ppr leagues has scored 10 plus points in both games this season up next we have dallas goddard you sort of already got my take on goddard when i mentioned Ertz. i think goddard is a phenomenal play when it comes to volume he has had eight plus targets in both contests we can say with confidence that he is one of carson wentz favorite players to target then there's also the fact that jalen rager he's not going to play with this being a game against cincinnati one that we expect to be the best offensive showing for the philadelphia eagles that could translate to potentially being one of the best offensive performances from Dallas Goddard. Regardless though, even in two very poor offensive performances for the Philadelphia Eagles, Dallas Goddard was still getting it done. Whether the team struggles or exceeds expectations, one thing is for sure, Goddard's floor is pretty high. The final top 12 tight end we have is Noah Fan of the Denver Broncos. The major news in this matchup, of course, is that Drew Locke is out for several weeks, leaving Jeff Driscoll as the projected starter. With the limited sample that we do have of Driscoll, we didn't see him targeting the tight end position position with much frequency that was of course on a Detroit Lions offense which never truly featured a tight end at least not in the receiving game so it's difficult for us to project that over to the Denver Broncos but it's equally if not more difficult for us to project the opposite we can't head into this game confidently saying that Noah Fant will receive the same amount of volume at the same quality but what we do know is that Noah Fant passes the eye test dramatically we would wish that with Cortland Sutton out and this team lacking some weapons in the receiving game Noah Fant should be one of the main players featured he is unfortunately though being out snapped by players like Logan Thomas and Tyler Eifert and has only had six targets in week one and five in week two but he scored in both contests the talent is all there and the Denver Broncos head into this matchup as six point home underdogs if they get down and down quick the passing volume it could be more than we've seen so far this season we're on to the next six these are outside the top 12 so ideally we wouldn't have them as starters so we'll run through them a bit quicker but we'll start with Evan Engram Evan Engram being healthy and outside the top 12, that's not really something anybody could have expected. He is, however, facing San Francisco, who has struggled defensively, especially when compared to last season. The one thing they have been pretty solid at defending, though, that's tight ends. Evan Engram, also in positive matchups, hasn't really provided the type of upside that we would have expected either and with this game having the lowest projected total of the entire week it doesn't leave much room for upside one thing worth noting though is that sterling shepherd has been placed on ir potentially more targets could go the way of evan engram but from what we've seen so far this season one to two more targets for engram isn't going to dramatically change his outcome 
Up next, we have Drew Sample of the Cincinnati Bengals. He was one of the players who was a top target on the waiver wire, taking over for the injured CJ Uzama, who had himself carved out a role that was pretty important for this offense. Sample himself, while taking over during the game, had double-digit targets. That bodes very well for him just being inserted in that role and continuing to get the volume that Uzama did. The only thing I have to say about it is in that game against the Cleveland Browns, Joe Burrow had 61 attempts attempts. The Cleveland Browns were also the 31st ranked defense against tight ends in 2019. They remain one of the worst defenses at guarding them this season, so the amount of targets that were going his direction could have been based more off of need or exploiting the matchup than actually representing what we could expect. The next player we have is Logan Thomas, and speaking of how bad Cleveland is at defending tight ends, well Washington this week, they face Cleveland. Logan Thomas, although many people don't really know of him and he's likely on most ways wires he had eight targets in week one nine targets in week two and although he hasn't been able to convert that into many yards or a lot of receptions volume against the Cleveland Browns it typically translates to production with that being said though I'm still not going out of my way to get Logan Thomas into my lineup if I have one of the preferred options over them. The projected total for this game is only 45 points, and the quality of targets when they're coming from Dwayne Haskins, it doesn't necessarily translate to the same amount of catchable targets as it would from another quarterback. The next tight end we have is Dalton Schultz of the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas is facing the Seattle Seahawks in a game that is the highest projected total of the entire week, coming in at 56 and a half points. And Dalton Schultz, he's coming off of a game in which he he had 10 targets. What was even better to see than the 10 targets was that he was able to convert nine of those targets into receptions, which not only means that he's a solid player, it means that Dak Prescott knows he can trust him. For a player that is going to be starting because the player ahead of him got injured, when your quarterback knows he can rely on you and you have safe hands, it's a positive sign for the early involvement. With that being said though, the Seattle Seahawks are actually pretty good at defending the tight end position. They held Hayden Hurst to just three receptions and we also have to be mindful that he's still an unproven product moving over to Chris Herndon there really isn't much that needs to be said about him the Colts have not allowed a game with more than two receptions to that position those two receptions only translated to eight receiving yards which is actually the high on the season that they have allowed the upside's not there the floor isn't there but he is playing a high amount of snaps Jamison Crowder has been ruled out so he'll be on the field when you're on the field you can always get lucky roll your your way into a touchdown and that's always a possibility. The final player we have is Jordan Reed of the San Francisco 49ers. When it comes to Jordan Reed, a lot of people are understandably going to be trying to get him in there over their starters because he was virtually free off the waiver wire, scored two touchdowns last week, and with George Kittle already being ruled out, it's quick to look at that and want to put that in your lineup. The New York Giants, however, although they're not seen as a tough defense, against tight ends, they get it done. Through two games, they've allowed a total of three receptions, 26 six yards so Jordan Reed will have an uphill battle when it comes to getting production Reed himself also hasn't been good in the area of yards after catch which is completely different than that of George Kittle he averaged six yards per reception in week one 7.1 yards per reception in week two which means there is almost no chance he pays off this start unless he scores a touchdown relying on a player to score a touchdown not really the best avenue to take especially when it's in a game that has one of the lowest projected totals of the week chances are he is not going to have a good day. If it does, it will take a certain amount of luck, and I'm trying to leave those types of players on my bench. But guys, that's going to do it for this video. We really hoped you enjoyed. If you did, how about hitting that like button? If you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. We thank you all for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.